Welcome to Stone Age Man, Neolithic Migrants, and Iron Age Celts. This is Melinda Cole Klein. During the early Middle Ages, Nennius, the 9th century Welsh monk, documented a history of Britain in the Homeric fashion of the Iliad and that of the poetic Roman historian Virgil in Aeneas. According to this Welsh monk, the first king of Britain was Brutus, having changed its name from Albion. Brutus was the great-grandson of Aeneas, the Trojan warrior who founded Rome. Thus, the origin myth of Britain ties its history to the heroic past of Troy. Later, this legendary myth would be expanded upon by Geoffrey Monmouth in The History of the Kings of Britain, published in 1136, and continued this national history to the invasion of the Saxons. And it would be these stories that Celtic poetic histories retell of their arrival from Greece by way of Africa. They settled across the European continent and made their way north to the British Isles. These traditional stories and myths recount their struggles with the ancient peoples in residence that eventually led to assimilation of Stone Age man and Neolithic migrants, including the Celts. Did early man from the continent travel as far north as Britain? There is evidence of a skeleton of a woman found in the Thames Valley from 150,000 years ago. This hunter-gatherer was an older relative of what later became known as Neanderthal man. Scholars have identified Neolithic man living and hunting in southern coastal England 30,000 years ago. At this time, before the end of the last ice age, there was a land bridge that reached from the European continent across into England. This land bridge, which is now underwater, allowed for hunter-gatherer foot traffic and seasonal migration when tracking woolly rhinoceros, mammoths, and reindeer. During Roman occupation, scholars pondered on the efforts by stone builders such as what we would see today in an area known as Stonehenge. The Romans stated it was a temple to the sun god Apollo. Medieval commentary suggested it was the work of wizards and perhaps linked to King Arthur and the invading Saxons. Some today suggest it was built by the priestly class of the Druids. However, most that observe this believe that the stone monuments were tied in some way to religious ideals or forms of justice. The fact remains clear that twice a year at Stonehenge, due to its construction, the sun becomes in line with what we call the summer and winter solstices. Like in other parts of the world, these western peoples lived in caves as the climate was very cold. They used flint tools such as arrowheads, bone tools, and ornaments made out of bones, but the ice advanced again, driving them southward as they came and left as the colder climates reached farther inland and pushed them farther south. Likely, these part-time residents moved freely between England and Wales and the European continent as they followed game migrations. Scholars have estimated that these part-time migratory humans might have only numbered a few hundred souls. In inhabiting northern European areas, this would become centuries later to be in larger quantity. About 12,000 years ago, as the cold receded north, 
some of these nomadic people settled and created societies with cultural traditions while they likely kept herds of animals and began to domesticate them. At this time, the land bridge still allowed some movement between the continent and Britannia. Settlements began to grow in size and area, especially along the coasts and rivers where food was readily available. Around 9,000 years ago, the land bridge became a swampy, wide river. Not too challenging of a sea voyage in those days. This is when the nomadic cave dwellers from the continent brought the first dogs. In time, wild dogs roamed freely in Britain. After the last ice age around 8300 BC, the climate became much warmer across northern Europe, which resulted in forests to grow over much of the land. Game occupied the forests such as wild pigs, birds, you would see elk and deer, which had previously been unavailable. Therefore, the warmer climate resulted in new food resources. This allowed the Stone Age hunter-gatherers to become more settled and not travel as far for food. Consider the time period 4500 to 2500 BC. This is remembered as the Neolithic Revolution and is hallmarked by early people using farm techniques. This was the beginning of civilization. The knowledge of plowing, for example, traveled with Neolithic man as he migrated across Europe. In time, this knowledge crossed the channel to Britannia. This pattern of living led to the clearing of forests that had previously sustained them to establish farming settlements. People learned how to raise animals and plants harvest and store cereal crops. This made food resources conveniently available, thus travel in search of food lessened. They developed irrigation techniques and the wooden plow. About 3000 BC, peoples from continental Europe crossed the channel in another migratory wave. It would be these people who would build the scattered stone monuments standing in Britain today. They bred cattle and also sheep and goats and grew wheat, though they lived in semi-nomadic livelihoods and they traveled with their dogs. Apparently, well at least according to some scholars, these dogs, what did they look like? Well, they were kind of like a fox terrier of sorts, long-legged and kind of scruffy looking. These migratory peoples built circular stone henges with high earthly embankments and deep ditches with a flat center feature. These people left behind axes, woodworking tools, blades and scrapers, also millstones that were used for grinding cereal grains. This allows us to know a little bit more about them and their culture. Pottery jugs have also been found in Neolithic sites. Due to the need for flint across farming communities of Europe and the Near East, a rapid trade began around 3000 BC. Therefore, the mining of flint became a vibrant part of the economy, which led to developed, well-traveled trade routes. Death and its mysteries brought life to religious observation and is a hallmark of cultural development. These people buried their dead in what was called long barrows, a collective vault in our modern sense. Many examples of this type of burial practice still survive. They were made of stone with large standing stones and boulders. 
Then the area was covered with dirt. Some of these barrows are very large, such as 82 feet by 328 feet have been found. Typically, barrows would be filled with around 50 bodies, lined in orderly fashion. Each body was accompanied with tools, pottery, weapons, and food, which suggests that these Neolithic peoples believed in an afterlife. These English barrows point east towards the rising sun. This design indicates the sun also played a role in death or their religious beliefs. Around 2000 BC, now this is remembered as the beginning of the Bronze Age, this brought another migration of peoples across the continent to Britannia. These Beaker people were more warlike. Their graves actually contained more weapons, swords, spears, and battle axes. They were organized and active builders using stone. These later peoples buried their dead alone or in pairs, not in the long barrows of the past. This burial practice was marked by mound building and many of these exist in Britain today. Royalty were buried in stone chambers fully clothed with their jewels and other symbols of wealth. By 1500 BC, cremation was a common technique used prior to burial. While much effort was used to create mounds in regards to burial grounds for the dead, the Beaker people lived in simple settlements and migrated when necessary. It is these people that built the stone circles and the standing stones. Scholars suggest the Beaker people came from what is now Spain and Portugal on the Iberian Peninsula. These people possessed early metal technology as a result of mining tin and copper. They became active traders and took tin and copper goods to the continent to be sold. The Neolithic peoples who mastered iron technology became the new masters of Europe. In history, we call these people the Celts. In time, they would dominate northwestern Europe. Aspects of their culture may be seen today in artwork, jewelry making, and language. Unlike the Neolithic people of the Mediterranean and Egypt, the Celts did not leave behind large building projects or monumental architecture. The Celts lived simply in a semi-nomadic lifestyle while their homes were built from organic tree matter or woven materials. Modern day Celtic languages survive today in Scotland, Ireland, Wales, and Brittany. Ancient peoples across Europe built stone monuments, but the largest of these artifacts is in fact found on the British Isles. There is much uncertainty surrounding the history of early stone builders who left monuments. In a time prior to the invention of the wheel, these early peoples showed a long dedication to their stone building and the structures that they left behind. This was a committed effort. Ancient Britain like other island settlements such as Greece, held traditions that were deep in magic and mystery. Ancient Britain was a place of powerful gods, giants and monsters, while it was considered by continental tribes to be home to magicians, sorcerers and unearthly spirits. The British countryside is scattered with ancient stone circles, such as Stonehenge or the Nine Maidens. Also you would find isolated hill forts and man-made earthly mounds such as the one called Silvery Hill 
This is the largest prehistoric mound in Europe. In addition, ancient structures and settlements have been unearthed and researched by archaeologists. What is the true significance to Neolithic man is often in our modern age shrouded in mystery and conjecture. 23,000 existing stone monuments in Britain today, including 900 stone circles, do exist. The oldest dates back about 5,000 years, and this estimate has been given by scholars, and it's made indirectly because dating stones is difficult. Therefore, archaeologists rely on other artifacts that might be found discarded nearby, such as a deer antler used for digging in the earth. Most were built about 4,500 years ago, 2,000 years before the Celts arrived. Some of the stones weighed several tons. However, mystery surrounds who built them and why. Some have called early man in Britain the Dawn people. They did not possess the knowledge of writing. Stonehenge is believed to be the greatest of the stone circles. And it was built in three stages, a thousand years apart, four thousand years ago, believed to be a temple with chieftain burial mounds found near the structure with the sunlight as a center place of observance. While the Egyptians were building the Great Pyramid at Giza around 2500 BC, the outer circle of Stonehenge was under construction. This outer circle contained rocks that scholars have calculated as weighing over 40 tons. The people who moved these great boulders that they made into pillars had transported them from a distance of about 30 miles or more, and this was also over rough terrain. This effort required thousands of workers. When it was complete, there was an inner circle, an outer circle, and tongue and groove carpentry style top stones securing the pillar boulders in a ring-like fashion. Why was it built? What set of ideas motivated these stone builders to contribute so many man hours to this architectural feat? Since the 1990s, there has been much scholarly interest in the historical nature of some stone monuments such as Stonehenge. In our recent time, technology and science have offered scholars new ways to determine a better understanding of soils, ice and its contents, and the age of materials found in ancient sites. After careful study of Stonehenge and the collection of evidence, Dr. Parker Pearson has offered a convincing set of answers for a history of Stonehenge, what it was and who built it. While I'm a historian and not an archaeologist, I still have to say that the most convincing evidence, and there's been a lot in the last few years, the most convincing evidence that I have seen lately is that belonging to Dr. Parker Pearson and his team of archaeologists. Dr. Parker Pearson was able to connect Stonehenge to the surrounding culture and believes, like others have suggested, that the purpose of Stonehenge was created to house and remember the spirits of the dead. But this archaeologist went further. He theorized it was linked to another sacred monument and prehistoric settlement. In 2008, this archaeological team aimed to solve the ancient riddle of Stonehenge and to form a convincing line of argument surrounding these people and their culture. After extensive excavations of the surrounding countryside, the historical picture by Dr. Parker Pearson became clear. 
Stonehenge was a part of a large religious ceremonial design. This main structure was likely built as a final resting place, as mentioned, for the ancestors. Only part of the story, the practices at the stone site was tied to a wooden henge, this is a circle complex, that was found only a couple miles away. While the stone henge represented the dead ancestors, the wooden henge marked life and the living. While in residence at the wooden henge, food and pottery evidence has supported the notion that this place was used to initiate fertility rites, to eat and drink, and generally feast in celebration of life, perhaps to settle disputes as well. Convincingly, this archaeological team was able to show thousands of people traveled from far distances to meet in this area in southern England twice a year. The purpose of this biannual migration was the ritualistic ceremonies they performed that marked the cycle of life and death. From one monument, a large group of people walked along the River Avon until they reached the other monument. And it would be along this riverside migration the dead made their journey to Stonehenge. According to this line of reasoning, the people who took part in this ritual were blessed by the ancestors with future prosperity in the upcoming year. Good harvest and fertility for early peoples was a most important feature in efforts to survive one year to the next. In time, this team, headed by Dr. Parker Pearson, located the temporary village used twice a year and the riverside route between both religious complexes. As a society, the Celts were based in tribes with their own names, tribal hierarchy and leadership, and each having a unique identity which carried geographic and territorial meanings. The clan system of Scotland is an example of this culture in the modern age. Within Celtic tribal society, a person's status was fixed. This society had a rigid hierarchical system based on inheritance, family, birth, and power. It considered kings at the top, followed by nobles and free commoners near the bottom. However, slavery was common and its share of poverty among undesirables. Kings were elected by the nobility from the kin of the king after his death. The elected king was a noble and likely, but not necessarily, the king's son. The Celtic nobility and those considered of royal birth kept rather separate from the ordinary people. This aristocratic base included two traditional classes. These included the warriors and the priests. All Celtic societies were geared towards fighting. Therefore, the noble warriors and their abilities were held in high regard. As a result, warfare formed a central feature in Celtic daily life. While a talented youth may become a noble warrior, the priests were always recruited from noble Celtic families. Like the warriors, they were privileged members of society. Unlike other Celtics, the priests could travel between tribes, something that apparently kings did not even condone or practice themselves. The Celtic priests were divided into three memberships. These categories are based on their duties, and they included the Druids, the Bards, and the Seers. Little is known about the Druids and their practices. While their roles were religious, they also held roles as judges 
and arbitrators in a lawyer-like fashion. They had the right to settle public and private disputes, pass judgment, and also decide on what punishment a crime might carry or a reward in another case. The Druids had higher status than that of the king. Therefore, the Druids held the power of the law in the legal sense, but also in the cultural sense. Because Druids had the power to excommunicate individuals or entire tribes, this made, in effect, a class of outcasts. The Druids were feared not only by the Celts, but by others because of their spiritual, political, and legal powers. This fear was heightened due to the fact that they practiced human sacrifice in reverence to their religious beliefs. While the Roman commentaries are filled with evidence in which Celts acted in barbaric ways, Romans, keep in mind, killed people for entertainment's sake and to illustrate and reinforce historical rituals such as those put on in a Colosseum. Julius Caesar commented on the power Druids held over the tribal clans. He argued that if you undermined the authority of the Druids and the priestly class in general, this would cause a disruption in their clan-based religious structure and methods of justice. Without this level of power and authority, this would enable the Romans to conquer them in a more effective manner. For instance, this would be like cutting off the head of a snake in one swift move rather than battling the creature until both of you were exhausted. The seers had the power to foretell the future. Their roles seem to have been connected to prophecies and poetry. The third priestly class were the bards. Their name actually means singer of praises. The primary role of the bards was to signal the praises or histories of events and individuals set to the playing of a stringed instrument called a lyre. On the other hand, the bard would weave tales in which bad acts by others were told as stories. Bad commentaries from bards could cause public humiliation. Thus the bards were feared for what they could say. Celtic art and craftsmanship was highly regarded in the past and has survived to the present. This ranges from jewelry to household metal ornaments made into a multitude of finished masterpieces. Metalwork art was elaborate and detailed and often decorated with gemstones. Decorated motifs were inspired by others such as the dragon image which was common among Scandinavians, though the finished piece would clearly be Celtic. Once the Celts adopted writing and Christian traditions, they transferred this motif embellishment and highly detailed drawings to their writing. While Christian monks would rid the Celts of the Druid priests, Celts became scribers these were writers of documents for and with the monks or became priests themselves. Once writing was established in Celtic areas, their forms of writing became highly distinctive. Celtic manuscript art is quite beautiful. The Celts had sacred places in which the dead would be invoked to give advice. This was done with the help of the Druids. Before becoming Christian Celts, like other cultures, they had sacred days and festivals, some of which has survived. Two examples are May Day, this is May 1st, and then there would be Halloween as we call it today, and this is October 31st. 
The Celts were polytheistic, meaning their religious structure included many gods. Male gods tended to be associated with the tribe or the home, while the female deities tended to be tied to the concept of land or territory. For the Celts, religion was tied to magic. The purpose of their religion was to beg favors from their gods, or in order to avoid divine retribution, they would perform rituals to appease their gods. Scholars have identified two main phases of Celtic society. From about 700 BC, Hallstatt culture, and these people used iron technology, and they were located in northern Austria, situated near a salt mine. Secondly, from about 300 BC, there was Latin period, emerging out of Switzerland. It would be these two groups that would migrate across Europe to Spain and eventually make their way to Britain. The village peoples of Latin were active metallurgists. A quantity of metal objects has been found near this lakeside settlement in Switzerland. The metal objects were thrown into the lake as religious offerings. Because of the metal objects found, archaeologists have concluded they actively traded with Mediterranean cultures. Memorable Celtic warrior traditions include their colorful displays, their heroic nature, and their courage. They were effective warriors across Europe. Such effective fighting talent and spirit successfully attacked Delphi, the Greek capital, sacked Rome in Italy, and held Roman legions in England. But this pursuit of war kept them from creating an empire and becoming a unified force. In addition, they fought each other and had a rather disorganized war-fighting strategies that defied, at times, logic. The goal in Celtic war gave glory to the individual, and it was this that the warrior pursued. To the Celts, war was not only normal, but highly desirable. This allowed young men to single themselves out as heroes. Therefore, this supported individual courage instead of the coordinated efforts of mass armies. A great crowd of warriors competed against each other for high achievements of prestige, glory, and honor. This meant Celtic armies were incredibly brave and prepared to die until the last man was left standing. Because Celts were competing in battle for honor and glory, they did not trust each other. This led to problems on the battlefield as compared with the organized fighting style of the Roman army and the chain of command they used to maintain order. Main differences between the two fighting styles were their level of training, response to orders, and amount of armor and weaponry each carried. While Roman ground troops were heavily armored and outfitted, most of the Celtic warriors were spearmen or held a sword and a dagger. They did not carry shields. The chieftain was the best outfitted among the Celts. These three factors placed the Roman legions at a fighting advantage. The Greeks and Romans wrote about the Celts. One of the richest sources of information comes from the writings by Julius Caesar. These commentaries were filled with stories that the Celts were barbarian in their fighting styles, community living, and were distrustful of one another. Like with many tribal peoples, such as the Celtic Scottish Highlanders of today, 
tribal bands formed from family alliances, fought each other to the death, practiced revenge over generations, and held grudges for long periods of time. In America, this Celtic warrior culture is reminiscent of the feud between the Hatfields and the McCoys that lasted from 1863 until recently in 2003, when a truce was called following a lawsuit brought over access to cemetery plots. Long story short, the Romans viewed the Celts in Gaul, Spain, and Britannia as uncivilized as compared with their own culture. This led to a time of expansion. Gaul, for example, was a Celtic tribal territory that was later conquered by Julius Caesar for the Roman Republic to bolster his military and political power. And the Huns under Attila would make the same attempt but failed. In time, Celts would attack Italy and the capital of Rome. The Celts were a lively threat to Roman rule. Celts migrated into Macedonia, the Near East, and attacked Greece. Once they landed in England, they settled as far north as Scotland and then Northern Ireland. While the Celts could be barbarian in some of their actions, they did not possess a civilization in the classic sense. They were highly accomplished artists and warriors, a proud and courageous people of the Western world that, unlike other ancient peoples, have survived to the present. In time, during and after the Roman period, the Germanic tribes invaded Celtic Europe, including present-day France, Britain, Spain, Italy, along with other national regions as shown on this map. The Angles and Saxons, along with the Danes, invaded England by crossing the North Sea. The Franks settled in Gaul while the Vandals and Goths made their way across Europe to the Iberian Peninsula. The Normans settled in what is northern France with the Burgundians to the south. Italy and the Roman Empire in the west fell due to the movement and military accomplishments by Germanic barbarian tribes. This pattern of military expansion and territorial by invaders north and east of the Danube set into motion events that would transform the post-Roman world and the European culture that would form in absence of imperial leadership. The fallout from the absence of Roman provincial rule would send the Christian West into a dark age. And this dark age would last 400 years.